in the Carthusian monastery where I was living for many years in France, we had, although he wasn't in the house at the time, one of our confreres, Don Hugues, who was a good artist, he spent many hours in beautiful, careful, neat calligraphy, writing out the whole gospel. And he interspersed it with little designs, pictures, cartoons, sometimes with tongue-in-cheek, but always quite reverent. He was in the freedom of the children of God, like angels who love to chuckle with their king. And when it came to this scene that we've just read, the little cartoon was that of a boat, and then these two good sons going off with this itinerant preacher, leaving Zebedee in this mode. Who knows, it might have been actually a bit close to the bone and fairly true to history. But what is clear is that this itinerant preacher had a magnetism about his person which was something else. It happens not just once, but several times in the calls. One is particularly dramatic. Levi, Matthew, up to no good in the eyes of the local people, working for the wrong side. And he just beckons or says, follow me. And he leaves everything. All his moor, moorings on earth are lost. Likewise, someone else in the money business, on a tree, Zacchaeus, come down. And there again, although he doesn't become an apostle, he certainly changes his way of life. And this we find in Christian history. People who, as it were, radiate something of that magnetism from the Lord. We have, in the Middle Ages, very powerful figures. One comes to mind immediately because his effect can be felt near where we are here. The young man, Bernard of Clairvaux, although he wasn't of yet of Clairvaux, but of Dijon at the time, he would have been 22 or so, the most 23, he came, not to Clairvaux, but to Cito, not alone, because his magnetism had already drawn friends, and a great band came with him. I think about 30 of them. And anyway, there it became a great boost to this new foundation, which was called the Novum Monasterium, the new monastery. They were already dressed a bit differently. They were not dyeing the wool into black, but they were wearing white. And they were following to the rule, ad literam, St. Benedict. And when it said keeping silence, they meant business. And it was perpetual silence, with no break or no recreation. When it said getting up at two o'clock, they meant business, and did so. When it said not eating meat, they meant business, and they did not do so. And on it went, which gave the very austere form of distortion life, which was what was given to us. Because when they were making all these foundations, the result of this huge influx, one of the first was Clairvaux, Clear Valley, and of course, he, though he was very young, was nominated immediately its first superior, abbot. And of course, the pattern continued, huge numbers coming in. And indeed, because he was such a dynamic, powerful figure, he was used by the church. He was on good terms with somebody who'd had links with him before, the Pope. And it was, I believe, for him that he wrote the De Consideratione, on consideration, that is, of things with regard to what, in, what is important and less important before God, lest we become vainglorious in these important positions. And, of course, the Pope used him when it came, really, the only thing they had left to fight the huge invasion of Christianity by the Islamic forces of violence. It's easy to conquer if you give people that alternative of being converted by force or chopping off their heads. You just wipe them off the face of the earth, and you come into the vacuum which is created. And it's still what's being used. Anyway, 
He, therefore, was the one that was used. He preached that crusade at Besle, in the pulpit which you can still see high up. And, of course, the famous saying, God wills it. And it was enough to make this huge galvanized group go off, of young men going off to do something in the only language that was going to have any effect against the Islamic bloc. But he was so popular in attracting vocations to the monastic life that when he went around preaching, mothers of families would hide their children from him and take them indoors because they knew that his magnetism was such they would perhaps never come back. So this was Bernard who, of course, decided that the order had to go further afield. They came to Waverley in England, the first house from there, Clairvaux. They came to Indy Gwynardab in Wales, Whitland, and there the first house from which all the others came was in Wales. And they came here to Mellifont, not far away from where we are, named after him because he is the Mellifluous doctor, doctor flowing with honey because of his great poetic nature, especially with regard to the Blessed Virgin. It was all very Marian. And from there it went all over Ireland. So the power of attraction, authenticity, a safe place. They were safe within those walls. They were kept from mortal sin. It was hard, but they got to glory. And I often think that when passing before the ruins of Dulic, which separates my hermitage from the parish church. Those walls, apart from still standing, including the great east window, remind us that those walls contained, channeled, protected souls going to glory. Take away that protection and they might not get there. It's easy to dismiss the monastic life, but it got people safe and sound to the other side. In fact, I heard this after the death of one of our brethren in France. The prior was preaching and did say that Frère Marie has gone to, in fact, he was trying to describe the big family. Because the monastic family goes on from generation to generation, on the big majority on the other side, waiting for us two to join them, safe and sound. I make a jump. How many today can say that when it comes to death, about any death, in Europe as we have it? Do people go with that security, safe and sound? Can we be sure? Yes, we're handing them on to God. Or are they going to some other place, some other experience? You who are googlified will know that there are plenty of testimonies out there from people who have had this experience and through medical skill or whatever, through the mercy of God, have been given a second chance. But quite a few have had precisely the experience of the other side. And it's serious stuff. Can you imagine what it would be to die suddenly, unpreparedly, and then, one moment afterwards, to be presented with one's own soul, as it is, to see its reality, and to realize that one's final no is still there in the air and cannot be taken back, ever. Can you imagine what that realization, which at that point has no more distraction possible, is? It is summed up by Michelangelo's picture in the Sistine Chapel of the damned soul in this posture, just expressing pure desperation. The fact is, I am lost. Now, do you think that's a joke? Do you think that those who have laughed at these issues in this life are laughing at that point? Hell is full of people who didn't believe it existed. Isn't Old Neck clever? With regard to the other side, it is consoling. <coughs> and it's avoiding the issue, even those key years of one's life, that is actually dangerous. It's not that long ago before in Catholic Ireland, young people would have been now and again exposed to the reality and even sent on retreat so as to make a clear choice. Still in the life of the church over the globe, it is there in some retreats, but it is there now often 
in different ways. One important one is that of the possibility for all ages to let the Lord call directly without intermediary in Eucharistic adoration, which is not less but more available than before in our day. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. This morning I had to go up to Silverstream and I was about to leave, having left them some things and having bought some things from the shop, which is something you can do without anyone being there, just put money in the box. And I was intercepted by one of the brethren, who so called me back immediately and wanted to talk. He's just made his first vows. And I was listening to what he was saying, and he gave me to understand what is emerging. He gave the testimony of his own diocese in the States as a point in question. They had started at one point some years ago to bring in perpetual adoration. And they had noticed on the timeline that that is the very point at which things changed. And a new pattern emerged. And an unexpectedly large number of candidates came forth. And in that particular area, there is a plethora of very good vocations now to the priesthood. And he was a case in point. The Lord did it because he was given a chance. Eyeball to eyeball, without intermediary. That was in the context of what we had started to talk about, that I share with you, that there is initiative now going on, that there will be... 40 days of perpetual adoration at Silverstream. I believe it's the beginning of Lent. Does anyone know more? It's going round. It's all a brand new initiative. And obviously the Holy Spirit is wanting it, possibly as something which will then make things happen more. Because we have noticed that what makes it possible is the cooperation between the consecrated in enclosure and the lay people. And it would be a huge blessing if that lamp were lit there at Silverstream. Adoration day and night in a dark world. And the fruits would be, I think, pretty tangible. Old Nick hates it. He'll do everything to stop it. And he has stopped it in some shape or form in many monasteries. How? The Google box and the television. Because if it goes on, what happens? The early rise is lost. And that's the very moment that old Nick loves the night. Those of you who find that you're woken up regularly at 3 o'clock in the morning without any reason need to be aware that that's the hour of unmercy when satanic rites are being performed. And we know that these satanic rites are in unexpected places in church circles, not accepting, it seems, Vatican itself underground. In the past, at least, there is evidence of this. In other places, too, I could mention, which would explain quite a few things. Old Nick is not a fairy tale. It's a serious force which wishes the maximum damage to the soul of man and therefore to the means of his salvation. He hates the Catholic Church especially because he knows, he knows perfectly well fullness is only there. He's succeeding also amongst the faithful, so called, by diminishing their faith, by even making useless certain things like adoration in some places. Do you know that by now it's acceptable that one can go into adoration and talk to one's neighbour? Open your eyes and ears and you'll be surprised. What kind of adoration and reparation is that, I ask you? So, I leave it with you, my friends. This is something that we can claim. The many spots in Ireland where adoration is available is from God. Let us do it well and feel the Lord's pain, especially in the sacramental sphere. I mentioned before that my next door neighbour in the monastery just recently has left the priesthood and is now with a person who's divorced. She already has a child of 18 by now. Very clever. 
because it was also an exorcist and a brilliant young man with a brilliant voice. So the whole chant has stopped as well. Isn't only clever. He hits hard at the best because they're the greatest nuisances to his 